Well, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, the question for day to day is something like this. What difference does forgiveness make for how I live? Or as a teacher of mine once said, if grace means that there is nothing more than I can do, well then, I'm going to live my life. What will I do? If I have been forgiven in Christ, if I have all the benefits of God, what am I going to do with those blessings and benefits in my life? You know, so often when we think about the motivation for doing good or living right, uh, there's always a way in which we operate with maybe a fear of the consequence of if we didn't do it. I mean, the fear of consequence of judgment or, you know, somehow it coming back on us. I mean, why is it when I'm driving the car and I see a cop car, the first thing I do is look at the speedometer? I mean, even if I'm driving under the speed limit, I mean, all of a sudden, boop, I look and, yep, okay, I'm safe, or, ooh, slow down a little bit. I'm reminded uh, uh, of a story. Um, it was uh, in church, and there was, you know, a young boy, I don't know, five, six, whatever, uh, a little rambunctious in worship, and finally the dad sort of had enough, and so he sort of swooped up the boy and was going to carry him up because the kid either needed a time out or time away so that everybody else could focus on what was happening in worship. And as they walked out the door, the kid, you know, in a loud voice over his dad's shoulder said, now you all pray for me. <laughs> I, I, I suppose deep down we wonder, we wonder if religion is a kind of if-then proposition. I mean, if I'm good, or good enough, then I will be rewarded. But if not, watch out. But what happens when that fear of judgment is taken away, overcome by the grace and the forgiveness of God? I mean, what is going to be our motivation at that point? When you begin with grace, well, then what's next? In a way, that's what Paul is getting at in our lesson today from Romans. He's saying that there is an obedience that comes from faith. There is a life of faithfulness that follows God's movement of grace. But it all happens in a different kind of way. And the key word for our lesson, our reading today, it was the very first word which you probably didn't even, you just weren't focused in on. And that word is therefore. Actually, what Paul is saying is more like a two-word phrase, because, therefore. I mean, because Christ has died for you, therefore, present yourselves to God. Because Christ was raised to life for you, therefore, be alive to God. Now, this is different than, I think, often how life works. I mean, we live more in an if-then sort of world. I mean, if you show up and do your job, well, then you'll get paid. Or, this one is for Michael. If you eat your vegetables and clean your plate, then you can have dessert. He who loves vegetables so much. <laughs> I, that, was, that was a rule in our house. I mean, if you're going to have dessert, you had to, you know, they put the lima beans on and you had to work through them, you know. Uh, sometimes we just went without dessert. <laughs> But, you know, God's grace doesn't work that way. Our life in faith doesn't work that way. It's not if you're good enough, then you're going to get the goods of God. But it operates more like a because, therefore. Because Christ was died and raised for you, Paul then says, therefore, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Therefore, live with an obedience that comes from the heart. So how does this therefore work? There was a, uh, another story of a grade school girl having a conversation with her dad. She was saying, Dad, why is it that we have to go to church? I mean, my friends, they don't go to church. They don't have to go to church. Why do we have to go to church? She wouldn't light up on the question. And then finally, the dad just sort of paused for a moment. And he said, you know, hon, we don't go to church because we have to go to church. We go because we have to. In other words, we don't go in order to get brownie points or show that somehow we're better than someone else. But rather we go 
because it's our response to God's faithfulness to go to us. We go because that's what it means to live consistent with the grace of God that has been given to us. You know, baptism is always linked with this notion of following Jesus. That in baptism, the gift of God's grace is also linked with the mission of God, that he might form disciples to follow him. You know, it's one of the men in the Thursday morning men's Bible study said, you know, what does it mean for, for me to follow Jesus? Well, in a way, what it means is that I'm going to pay attention to what Jesus did and said, and, and if that he cared about something, I'm going to care about that as well. If he paid attention to something, I'm going to pay attention to that as well. I'm going to let him be sort of my guide in life. Paul says that we are always, in a way, presented with a choice. I mean, I'm going to follow the way of Jesus, or will I follow some other desire or pathway? One of the things I noted in our reading today is that, in a way, it starts surprisingly on a negative note. Paul says, therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in you. Do not let sin exercise dominion. What does that mean? I think what Paul is trying to tell us and remind us, you know, that being human is a fraught and fragile endeavor. And the question is, are we going to let that flawed character that is a part of all of us sort of have say and dominion or rule over us or not? We might put it this way. Are we going to play games with the grace of God or not? Paul puts it this way. I mean, should we sin all the more so that we can have all the more forgiveness? I mean, sort of like it's potluck. Why bother? We would maybe put it a little bit differently in today. You know, we say, well, I got grace on Sunday, so what difference does it make what I do on Monday or what I do on Friday night? I remember a milestone conversation. Uh, it was in another church, third graders. They were going through the Ten Commandments. You know, this is what it says, and now... What do you, what, how would you say what it means? And they're kind of going along, and all of a sudden they came to the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And all of a sudden the parents kind of got a little quiet and uncomfortable, and finally they had to ask the question, well, what does this mean? And one of the third graders raised their hands and said, well, don't be an adult. <laughs> For Paul, <laughs> no. they're in children's chat. <laughs> For Paul... Our life and faith is really about our whole self. It's not about a part of ourself. That Jesus was died and raised for the whole of us. Now, what will that mean for the whole of our life in response to God? What does it mean to practice or live into the resurrection of Jesus, to practice resurrection? Over the past uh, weeks uh, in my wife's family, Becky, her, they've been keeping vigil over her mom as she came to the end of her life and drew her last breath. And I've been thinking about her witness to this grace of God and the way in which she lived into sort of the therefore of uh, what Paul is talking about. You know, she would never have thought of herself as somehow special or deserving sort of commendation or that her life of faith was unusual. And perhaps because it was so ordinary, that it's in its ordinariness, in its familiarity, it has something to tell us and to remind us about the therefores that Paul is talking about. It kind of gives clarity as to what it means that because Christ has died, therefore, this is what it means to live into the grace of God. I mean, she was baptized as an infant. She affirmed her faith at Central Lutheran Church in Des Moines. She never thought of her faith as somehow an achievement, sort of look what I have done. She always at that point would recite the third article to the creed that she learned in catechism where Luther said, you know, when it comes to my faith, I believe that I cannot believe on my own. It's not about me, but rather the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened, enlightened and sanctified and kept me in faith. That is because God has been faithful to me, because God has taken action in the Spirit in me, therefore I might live a life of faith. Her friends were important to her, especially her church friends. 
When she was younger, she was the one who would bring the salad, you know, to church. She was the one who gathered with the ladies in the circles, her Bible study, and participated and led. She was the one who offered her gifts, you know, for the life of the church in all of its ways of witness and serving. But one of the things about her was that over the last 17 years, she had a progressive dementia. And there came a point a long time ago where she could no longer make a contribution in the same way. She could no longer bring a salad to the gathering. She no longer could make the contribution to the conversation. And yet what was striking was that the church that knew her for all those years continued to welcome and receive her in full dignity. Because there was this awareness that because our dignity as children of God is given to us in our baptism, therefore, how we treat one another and bestow on them their dignity is related to that grace in baptism. And it is not about the competencies we bring in any particular moment. She was a quiet person perhaps more the one to listen than to speak. Yet whenever she spoke, you always had a sense that she was speaking out of those deep therefores, that deep resonance of what it means to live in response to the grace of God. Thirty years ago, uh, Becky's older brother went to Thailand, and there he met the love of his life. He called back home saying that he was going to be getting married, and he was going to be bringing her back to Minnesota from Thailand. There was a grandmother uh, in the family who could not put all of this together. Uh, I mean, her family came from Sweden. She had no idea what to do with Thailand. Uh, And she said, what are we going to do? It was Becky's mom who said, you know, we're going to love her and we're going to welcome her. But she did not say that because she wanted to be nice. It was more that, you know, because we have been loved and welcomed in Christ, therefore, what does that mean for how we act and receive and welcome one another? And she lived into it, and the family received this person. Because, therefore, she had a wonderful singing voice. It was an alto voice. She sang in the Gustavus Choir. She sang in the choir, adult choir at church. Uh, It was those old Swedish and Norwegian songs that not only gave voice to her faith, but there was a way in which I think they spoke to her. They were like God's word set to music. And even though when it came to the end, in fact, for many years, it was not possible really for her to carry on a conversation. Yet uh, the music therapist would come and she would play uh, those hymns and then they would sing, and Jean Jean could sing every word to every hymn. They still spoke to her. And it was in the last days of life that there would be a CD playing in her room, a CD of those old Scandinavian hymns. And when we were uh, gathered around there facing the mortality of life, those songs continued to speak about the life of God the great therefore of what we have in Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness. Abide with me, fast falls the evening tide, children of the heavenly Father. It was like this one who could no longer speak was yet still telling us of those great therefores that because Christ has died and risen, therefore we are embraced in the great life of God. And it's not just simply for the end of life, but for every day in between and leading up to it. Because, therefore, because God has done it all, therefore, what shall we do? Therefore, how shall our life bear witness to the life of God for us? Because, Therefore, amen.